have come to the end of a rather lengthy day, and we're tired, and we're ready to go. Interestingly enough, we started this day with a story about Jesus, who had come to the end of a very lengthy day, and he was tired. And some disciples were leaving him. And he looked on them with forlorn eyes and said, Will you also go away? That is a cry that today has echoed across the years. And I can hear the trembling in his voice today as he looks upon you and I and says, Will you also go away? You do what you want on this long day, but I think I can stay just a little longer. And I hope you can too. In today's meeting, we have learned about Jesus Christ being the only way, the way, the truth, and the life. There's no access to God except through Him. There is no way to salvation and resurrection except through Him. There is no source for absolute truth except through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is no life worth living other than the moral life that He's commanded us to live. He is the only right source for our doctrine. He is the only way. We recognize that today. We believe that and we teach that. But as our capable speakers have warned us today, God has enemies that do not believe that. And they don't want us to believe it. And they don't want us to teach it. And because of that, my friends, we have a fight on our hands. And I believe the best summation that we could have for today's study is an exhortation that you and I in this generation would join this fight, would be zealous in this fight, and that we would see that this fight is carried on to future generations. I can't think of anything more important that we could carry away from this meeting than that we would take the message of Christ to the world around us in our day and pass that zeal on to our young people. I believe that is of critical importance because of the fight that is on our hands. The Bible teaches us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that the church is a heavenly Jerusalem. The church is a heavenly Jerusalem. It's a spiritual Jerusalem today. And the fight that we have to defend this spiritual Jerusalem is a spiritual fight. I want to tell you where the knife show is. The knife show is right here in my right hand. The sword of the Spirit. And this knife will cut the hearts of men and women and bring souls to Christ and show them the Jesus that is the way, the truth, and the life. We have a spiritual weapon and God calls upon us to wield this spiritual weapon, to join the spiritual fight, to defend the spiritual city of Jerusalem because God's enemies surround the broken walls and they threaten our existence. And I can't think about that without thinking about what was happening in Nehemiah's day and the fight God's people had on their hands at that time. We read of Nehemiah's call to to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem and defend the city of Jerusalem as the people of God fought to defend her. Of course, there it was a physical city with a physical battle. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, the great prophet issues the call to war, the call to arms. He said, I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. He called upon God's people then to join the fight thinking not only of themselves but of their brethren. Not only of that generation, but of future generations. To think of the years yet to come and the battles yet to be fought. But the battle that they had to face was of such a nature that it required a very immersive effort, total engagement, because there were breaches in the wall. And they needed people to stand in those gaps, to work feverishly to build and close in the walls and fight feverishly to defend God's people against God's enemies who wanted with all their might to stop the work. Does that sound like anything we're facing today? That sounds a lot like what we're facing today, brothers and sisters. 
And so it is with this urgency that I echo Nehemiah's words and say, we've got to stand up together and fight. We've got to think about our brothers and our sisters. We've got to think about our families. We've got to think about our children and their children and their children under whatever time is left here on this earth. We've got to join this fight. So immersive was their battle. They embraced a rather interesting strategy. In verse 16 through 18 of Nehemiah 4, we read, Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of his builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. With what zeal they must have joined this task that God had given them to do. On the one side they had the instruments of construction and on the other side the armaments of war. And so it is for you and I today as God implores us to join this fight to build and defend, to defend our families, to think about the future. And we join this fight when we embrace the message that we've been taught today about Jesus Christ being the only way, we join that fight when we embrace Christ ourselves as an individual, going to Him and Him alone for salvation and resurrection, going to Jesus and none other for the source of absolute truth, going to Christ for our doctrine, for our direction in our moral lives or our daily lives. As we seek to defend the spiritual Jerusalem today to build and defend, we must stand up for these things and teach others. We need to have an attitude like Isaiah the prophet had. We read about him in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. He said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. God was looking for someone who would stand up and take the message of his word and teach others. And it had that same urgency we find in the battle they were fighting in Nehemiah chapter 4 and the same sense of urgency that we need today, my friends, brothers and sisters, family of God. And awed by God's glory, Isaiah could not hold back. He said, here am I, send me, I will go, I'll do what I can. I want to do my part to join the fight and tell others about the truth of God. And that's what we're looking for today. That's what we must have today. Not somebody who's going to dwell on, well, what's the next person going to do? I wonder what they're going to do. We need someone who's learned today about God's glory as we've been taught and the glory of His Son and the fact that He's the only way and says, I want to go. I want to help. I want to tell the story of Jesus. And who's going to answer that call? Who's going to leave here today with an unquenchable fire that says, I must go. For the glory of God, I must join this fight. To accomplish this, we've got to start young. Yesterday is too late. We've got to start young. My brother's 48 years old. When he was standing up here today, and talking to you, did you think he talked with zeal and passion about his topic? I want to tell you something about Mike, and I hope I don't embarrass him as I talk about him. But he had that much zeal when he was eight. He did. During the summertime, he might spend half the summer day with his Bible open studying, writing up little lessons, jotting down scripture lists about different topics and things like that. I want to know where the eight-year-old today is that will give half their summer day for that. Where's the eight-year-old today that will say, Here am I, send me. It's not impossible. I watched the little fella grow up that way. There's a reason he's zealous today. He's been that way since his youth. That's what they taught him to do. We need people that are willing to start young. We need people that are willing to study hard. Larry mentioned his library. Let me tell you, it's big. While Larry was standing up here talking, I was thinking the same thing. I think every time I hear Larry preach, there stands an eloquent man. There stands a man who is capable of defending the truth. You know, there's a reason he can do that. It's because he spent untold hours reading those stacks of books in his library to learn what the unbeliever is saying about moral relativism. 
that there is no absolute truth and understand how to defend the truth against that. There's a reason that they picked him to do that talk. There's a reason he's thus equipped because he's studied hard and we need that. I want to know where the young soldier of the cross is that'll say, because of God's glory, here am I, send me. I'll do the studying that's necessary. I'll start young. I'll study hard. I'll do whatever it takes to learn what to say. When the unbeliever says, no, he's not the only way. As you were seeing Ty with his hair turned to silver, not that much, but a little bit, at least it wasn't falling out like some of you. I was thinking of 16-year-old Ty. Now, if you ask Ty how long he spent preparing this lesson for today, I don't know what he would tell you, but I know what I would tell you. I've known him for 30 years, and he's been working on it ever since. The first time I ever met Ty, he and I walked a church parking lot together in Oklahoma City, and he talked about the Bible and God and Jesus Christ and the work. And ever since then, and I'm sure long before then, he was putting forth a consistent effort to prepare himself for the days like today and fights like the one that we're in right now. And so where are the young ones? Where's the 16-year-old today that's walking that parking lot out there talking to their friends about the church and the work of the Lord and the future if there is going to be one for God's kingdom in this country? We need someone willing to start young, study hard, and put forth a consistent effort. And it's kind of like our folks told us, it's not just enough to work hard, you've got to work smart. And so it takes more than just consistent effort, it takes particular effort. And if there's anybody in this building that puts forth particular effort on anything, it's Pat Manning on a sermon. Trust me, I know, I trained under him. He's particular. I want to call him the sermon shredder because he shredded plenty of mine. said, let me show you how you need to do that, Dave. But he's harder on himself. It's not enough to work hard. You've got to work smart. You've got to put forth a particular effort to do, do, to do it just right. Where are, the, where are the people that's going to carry that fight into the next generation? That's what we're looking for today. We're looking for the one who will stand up and say, here am I, send me. When we were talking about today's program and planning the speeches, this is the part where Brother Larry Fambro looked at me and said, Dave, this is where you got to take off the preacher hat and put on your granddad hat. And I thought, oh, goody, I get to talk about my grandkids. We've got one and another and soon to be here, Lord willing, and we're excited about them. If you can rest easy, I deleted all the Lexi slides. Because that's not what Larry meant for me to stand up here and talk to you about. Larry understood that I'm concerned about the future and I'm concerned about our grandchildren. I'm concerned about this spiritual fight being carried into their future generations when they have grandchildren should time go on that long. That concerns me and it better concern you. I'm 46 years old, and let's just say in the last 40 years, I've seen a lot of changes in our society, and they're not all good. You know, I grew up in a world where not everybody went to the same church, but everybody believed that Jesus was the only way. That's gone. The Bible Belt has long since become unbuckled and slowly slipped off of America's britches. It ain't looking good. I grew up in a world where the answers to the survey that Brother Ty mentioned were totally different. I can remember the first young lady that showed up at Empire High School in southern Oklahoma with child. It was strange. Now they got schools full of them. Things have changed and I can't help but wonder with the heart wrenching and the yearnings of a grandfather so love struck, I can't help but wonder what's it going to be like when my grandkids have grandkids? Is it going to get any worse? Could it get any worse? Don't tempt fate. It could. It's been worse before. And it could get worse again. When we think about that and we think about the future, I think about something that God said. 
to his people in Psalms chapter 78. God had a vision for Israel's future. He said he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children and that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. God wanted to teach wanted Israel to teach their future generations with a vision not just that they would learn about his word but that they would teach their future generations who would teach their future generations. He wanted that work to go on for the future and that's the vision that we should have for God's people today. And so we're looking for people that will start young, study hard, work consistently and work particularly to get the job done and do it right to join the fight. Where will the church be in 40 years? And will my great-great-grandchildren even know about all this that we're talking about today? Shall the gospel herald fall silent while our children learn from our example to love the world and the things that are in the world? Shall the rafters that once rang with God's praise span silently over the empty halls of worship that collect cobwebs because nobody's there anymore? What lies out there in the future? That's what the granddad had is saying. The passion of the preacher says, let's join the fight. The granddad's saying, who's gonna? We need someone to. Shall Jesus be a stranger to future generations who bear the same names of those of us registered here today? Can you imagine the nightmare of your offspring not knowing to whom shall we go? It's not a hopeless picture. I hope you don't feel like it is. It's an urgent picture, but it's not a hopeless picture. I want to tell you briefly about a conversation I had with Brother David Pinkerton the other day in Plainview, Texas. We were talking about a growing and changing subculture among our youth in the church. We have a lot of young people who show up at a gospel meeting in the sermon, uh, in the summer, excuse me, ready to work. And frankly, they're offended at the, insinu- at the insinuation that they won't come to the meeting unless we take them bowling afterward. They're better than that. They are. They're capable of more. And they expect more. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're showing up with their sleeves rolled up and their work gloves on. They're ready to get out and serve. They're ready to sit down and study. They're ready to stand out and teach. They want to hand out flyers. They want to talk to people about their souls. They want to go carry the message that says, to whom shall we go? Jesus is the only place we can go. He's the only one to whom we can go. It's not a totally hopeless picture. There's great hope. My wife and I are blessed to have a lot of these young people in our home at different times through the year, especially in the summer. Sometimes I have to get up in the middle of the night to chase them off to bed because they've got a zeal. They want to stay up and work. They want to study. They want to learn. You know what I see them doing? I see them stepping up to the city of Jerusalem. It's a spiritual city, and it's the bride of Christ. There may be breaches in the wall, there may be problems, there may be threats from outside, but I see them with the instruments of construction on one side and the armaments of war on the other. I see young soldiers of the cross being trained to join this fight that we're talking about today and to carry it into future generations. And so I believe as that old song says, that gospel waves will roll in power and might. I believe that Zion's call will sweetly ring in land and sea, bidding us to that home above. And with that hope, I see Jesus. I see Jesus long ago standing in a Galilean synagogue watching former disciple after former disciple fade into the distance and I see you and you and some of you young folks here and here and back over here I see some of our young people gathered around to Jesus clinging to Jesus and I see Jesus looking at them saying will you also go away And the fruit of their lives is saying, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. They believe it. 
They're living it and they want to teach it and they want to tell it and they want to see the work go on. And I want my grandkids to be there. 